Matthew Henry's Commentary on the Whole Bible An Exposition with Practical Observations of The Book of Psalms Psalm 69 David penned this psalm when he was in affliction and in it. 1. He complains of the great distress and trouble he was in and earnestly begs of God to relieve and succor him, verses 1-21. 2. He imprecates the judgments of God upon his persecutors, verses 22-29. 3. He concludes with the voice of joy and praise, in an assurance that God would help and succor him, and would do well for the church, verses 30-36. Now in this, David was a type of Christ, and divers passages in this psalm are applied to Christ in the New Testament and are said to have their accomplishment in him, verses 4, 9, 21, and verse 22 refers to the enemies of Christ. So that, like the 22nd psalm, it begins with the humiliation and ends with the exaltation of Christ, one branch of which was the destruction of the Jewish nation for persecuting him, which the imprecations here are predictions of. In singing this psalm we must have an eye to the sufferings of Christ, and the glory that followed, not forgetting the sufferings of Christians too, and the glory, the glory that shall follow them, for it may lead us to think of the ruin reserved for the persecutors and the rest reserved for the persecuted. To the chief musician upon Shoshanim. A Psalm of David. Psalm 69 verses 1 to 12. In these verses David complains of his troubles, intermixing with those complaints some requests for relief. 1. His complaints are very sad, and he pours them out before the Lord, as one that hoped thus to ease himself of a burden that lay very heaven upon him. 1. He complains of the deep impressions that his troubles made upon his spirit, Verses 1 and 2 The waters of affliction, those bitter waters, have come unto my soul, not only threaten my life, but disquiet my mind, they fill my head with perplexing cares and my heart with oppressive grief, so that I cannot enjoy God in myself as I used to do. We shall bear up under our troubles if we can but keep them from our hearts, but when they put us out of the possession of our own souls, our case is bad. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but what shall we do when the spirit is wounded? That was David's case here. His thoughts sought for something to confide in, and with which to support his hope, but he found nothing, he sunk in keep mire, where there was no standing, no firm footing, the considerations that used to support and encourage him now failed him, or were out of the way, and he was ready to give himself, himself up for gone. He sought for something to comfort himself with, but found himself in deep waters that overflowed him, overwhelmed him, he was like a sinking drowning man in such confusion and consternation. This points at Christ's sufferings in his soul and the inward agony he was in when he said, Now is my soul troubled, and my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, for it was his soul that he made an offering for sin. And it instructs us, when we are in affliction, to commit the keeping of our souls to God, that we may be neither soured with discontent nor sink into despair. 2. He complains of the long continuance of his troubles, verse 3 I am weary of my crying. Though he could not keep his head above water, yet he cried to his God, and the more death was in his view the more life was in his prayers, yet he had not immediately an answer of peace given and no, nor so much of that support and comfort in praying which God's people used to have, so that he was almost weary of crying, grew hoarse, and his throat so dried that he could cry no more. Nor had he his wanted satisfaction in believing, hoping, and expecting relief. Relief. My eyes fail while I wait for my God, he had almost looked his eyes out, in expectation of deliverance. Yet his pleading this with God is an indication that he is resolved not to give up believing and praying. His throat is dried, but his heart is not, his eyes fail, but his faith does not. Thus our Lord Jesus on the cross cried out, Why hast thou forsaken me? Yet, at the same time, he kept hold of his relation to him, My God, my God. 3. He complains of the malice and multitude of his enemies, their injustice and cruelty, and the hardships they put upon him, verse 4. They hated him, they would destroy him, for hatred aims at the destruction of the person hated, but what was his iniquity? What was his sin? What provocation had he given them, that they were so spiteful towards him? None at all, they hate me without a cause, I never did them the least injury, that they should bear me such ill will. Our Savior applies this to himself, John 15 verse 25 They hated me without a cause. We are apt to use this in justification of our passion against those that hate us, that we never gave them cause to hate us.
but it is rather an argument why we should bear it patiently, because then we suffer as Christ did, and may then expect that God will give us redress. They are my enemies wrongfully, for I have been no enemy to them. In a world where unrighteousness reigns so much we must not wonder if we meet with those that are our enemies wrongfully. Let us take care that we never do wrong, and then we may the better bear it if we receive wrong. These enemies were not to be despised, but were very formidable both for their number they are more than the hairs of my head, Christ's enemies were numerous, those that came to seize him were a great multitude, how were those increased that troubled him? And for their strength they are mighty in authority and power. We are weak, but our enemies are strong, for we wrestle against principalities and powers. Then I restored that which I took not away. Applying this to David, it was what his enemies compelled him to, they made him suffer for that offense which he had never been guilty of, and it was what he consented to, that, if possible, he might pacify them, and make them to be at peace with him. He might have insisted upon the laws of justice and honor, the former not requiring and the latter commonly thought to forbid the restoring of that which we took not away, for that is to wrong ourselves both in our wealth and in our reputation. Yet the case may be such sometimes that it may become our duty. Blessed Paul, Paul, though free from all men, yet, for the honor of Christ and the edification of the church, made himself a servant to all. But, applying it to Christ, it is an observable description of the satisfaction which he made to God for our sin by his blood, then he restored that which he took not away, he underwent the punishment that was due to us, paid our debt, suffered for our offense. God's glory, in some instances of it, was taken away by the sin of man, man's honor and peace and happiness, were taken away, it was not he that took them away, and yet by the merit of his death he restored them. For, he complains of the unkindness of his friends and relations, and this is a grievance which with an ingenuous mind cuts as deeply as any, verse 8 I have become a stranger to my brethren, they make themselves strange to me and use me as a stranger, are shy of conversing with me and ashamed to own me. This was fulfilled in Christ, whose brethren did not believe on him, John 7 verse 5, who came to his own and his own received him not, John 1 verse 11, and who was forsaken by his disciples, whom he had been free with as his brethren. 5. He complains of the contempt that was put upon him, and the reproach with which he was continually loaded. And in this especially his complaint points at Christ, who for our sake submitted to the greatest disgrace, and made himself of no reputation. We having by sin injured God in his honor, Christ made him satisfaction, not only by divesting himself of the honors due to an incarnate deity, but by submitting to the greatest dishonors that could be done to any man. Two things David here takes notice of as aggravations of the indignities done him. 1. The ground and matter of the reproach, verses 10 and 11. They ridiculed him for that by which he both humbled himself and honored God. When men lift up themselves in pride and vain glory, they are justly laughed at for their folly. But David chastened his soul, and clothed himself with sackcloth, and from his abasing himself they took occasion to trample upon him. When men dishonor God it is just that their so doing should turn to their dishonor, but when David, purely in devotion to God and to testify his respect to him, wept and chastened his soul with fasting, and made sackcloth his garment, as humble penitents used to do, instead of commending his devotion and recommending it as a great example of piety, they did all they could both to discourage him in it and to prevent others from following his good example, for that was to his reproach. They laughed at him as a fool for mortifying himself thus and even for this he became a proverb to them, they made him the common subject of their banter. We must not think it strange if we be ill-spoken of for that which is well done, and in which we have reason to hope that we are accepted of God. Our Lord Jesus was stoned for his good works, John 10 verse 32, and when he cried, Eli, Eli my God, my God, God, was bantered, as if he called for Elias. 2. The persons that reproached him, verse 12. 1. Even the gravest and the most honorable, from whom better was expected, those that sit in the gate speak against me, and their reproaches pass for the dictates of senators and the decrees of judges, and are credited accordingly. 2. The meanest and the most despicable, the abjects, Psalm 35 verse 15, and scum of the country, the children of fools, yeah, the children of base men, Job 30 verse 8. Such drunkards as these make themselves vile, and he was the song of the drunkards, they made themselves, and their companions merry with him.
See the bad consequences of the sin of drunkenness, it makes men despisers of those that are good, 2 Timothy 3 verse 3. When the king was made sick with bottles of wine he stretched out his hand with scorners, Hosea 7 verse 5. The bench of the drunkards is the seat of the scornful. See what is commonly the lot of the best of men, those that are the praise of the wise are the song of fools. But it is easy to those that rightly judge of things to despise being thus despised. 2. His confessions of sin are very serious, verse 5 O God. Thou knowest my foolishness, what is and what is not, my sins that I am guilty of are not hidden from thee, and therefore thou knowest how innocent the first am of those crimes which they charge upon me. Note, even when, as to men's unjust accusations, we plead not guilty, yet before God, we must acknowledge ourselves to have deserved all that is brought upon us, and much worse. This is the genuine confession of a penitent, who knows that he cannot prosper in covering his sin, and that therefore it is his wisdom to acknowledge it, because it is naked and open before God. 1. 1. He knows the corruption of our nature, thou knowest the foolishness that is bound up in my heart. All our sins take rise from our foolishness. 2. He knows the transgressions of our lives, they are not hidden from him, no, not our heart sins, no, not those that are committed most secretly. They are all done in his sight, and are never cast behind his back till they are repented of and pardoned. This may aptly be applied to Christ, for he knew no sin, yet he was made sin for us, and God knew it, nor was it hidden from him, when it pleased the Lord to bruise him and put him to grief. 3. His supplications are very earnest. 1. For himself, verse 1 Save me, O God. Save me from stinking, from despairing. Thus Christ was heard in that he feared, for he was saved from letting fall his undertaking, Hebrews 5 verse 7. 2. For his friends, verse 6 Let not those that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, and that seek thee, O God of Israel. Under these two characters we ought to seek God, and in seeking him to wait on him, as the God of hosts, who has all power to help, and as the God of Israel in covenant with his people, whom therefore he is engaged in honor and truth to help, be ashamed and confounded for my sake. This intimates his fear that if God did not appear for him it would be a discouragement to all other good people, and would give their enemies occasion to triumph over them, and his earnest desire that whatever became of him all that seek God and wait upon him, might be kept in heart and kept in countenance, and might neither be discouraged in themselves nor exposed to contempt from others. If Jesus Christ had not been owned and accepted of his Father in his sufferings, all that seek God and wait for him would have been ashamed and confounded, but they have confidence towards God, and in his name come boldly to the throne of grace. For his plea is very powerful, verses 7 and 9. Reproach was one of the greatest of his burdens, Lord, roll away the reproach, and plead my cause, for. 1. It is for thee that I am reproached, for serving thee and trusting in thee, for thy sake I have borne reproach. Those that are evil spoken of for well-doing may with a humble confidence leave it to God to bring forth their righteousness as the light. 2. It is with thee that I am reproached, the zeal of thy house has eaten me up, that is, has made me forget myself and do that which they wickedly turn to my reproach. Those that hate thee in thy house for that reason hate me, because they know how zealously affected I am to it. It is this that has made them ready to eat me up, and has eaten up all the love and respect I had among them. Those that blasphemed God, and spoke ill of his word and ways, did therefore reproach David for believing in his word and walking in his ways. Or it may be construed as an instance of David's zeal for God's house, that he resented all the indignities done to God's name as if they had been done to his own name. He laid to heart all the dishonor done to God and the contempt cast upon religion, these he laid nearer to his heart than any outward troubles of his own. And therefore he had reason to hope God would interest himself in the reproach reproaches cast upon him, because he had always interested himself in the reproaches cast upon God. Both the parts of this verse are applied to Christ. 1. It was an instance of his love to his father that the zeal of his house did even eat him up when he whipped the buyers and sellers out of the temple, which reminded his disciples of this text, John 2 verse 17. 2. It was an instance of his self-denial, and that he pleased not himself, that the reproaches of those that reproached God fell upon him, Romans 15 verse 3, and therein he set us an example. Psalm 69 verses 13 to 21.
David had been speaking before of the spiteful reproaches which his enemies cast upon him, here he adds, But, as for me, my prayer is unto thee. They spoke ill of him for his fasting and praying, and for that he was made the song of the drunkards, but notwithstanding that, he resolves to continue praying. Note, though we may be jeered for well-doing, we must never be jeered out of it. Those can bear but little for God, and they're confessing his name before men, that cannot bear a scoff and a hard word rather than quit their duty. David's enemies were very abusive to him, but this was his comfort, that he had a God to go to, with whom he would lodge his cause. They think to carry their cause by insolence and calumny, but I use other methods. Whatever they do, as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord. And it was in an acceptable time, not the less acceptable for being a time of affliction. God will not drive us from him, though it is need that drives us to him, nay, it is the more acceptable, because the misery and distress of God's people make them so much the more the objects of his pity, it is seasonable for him to help them when all other helps fail, and they are undone, and feel that they are undone, if he do not help them. We find this expression used concerning Christ. Isaiah 49 verse 8, In an acceptable time have I heard thee. Now observe. 1. What his requests are. 1. That he might have a gracious audience given to his complaints, the cry of his affliction, and the desire of his heart. Hear me, verse 13, and again, hear me, O Lord. Verse 16, hear me speedily, verse 17, not only hear what I say, but grant what I ask. Christ knew that the Father heard him always, John 11 verse 42. 2. That he might be rescued out of his troubles, might be saved from sinking under the load of grief, deliver me out of the mire, let me not stick in it, so some, but help me out, and set my feet on a rock, Psalm 40 verse 2, might be saved from his enemies, that they might not swallow him up, nor have their will against him, let me be delivered from those that hate me, as a lamb from the paw of a lion, verse 14. Though I have come in to keep waters, verse 2, where I am ready to conclude that the floods will overflow me, yet let my fears be prevented and silenced, let not the water flood, though it flow upon me, overflow me, verse 15. Let me not fall into the gulf of despair, let not the deep swallow me up, let not that pit shut her mouth upon me, for then I am undone. He gave himself up for lost in the beginning of the psalm, yet now he has his head above water, and is not so weary of crying as he thought himself. 3. That God would turn to him, verse 16, that he would smile upon him, and not hide his face from him, verse 17. The tokens of God's favor to us, and the light of his countenance shining upon us, are enough to keep our spirits from sinking in the deepest mire of outward troubles, nor need we desire any more to make us safe and easy, verse 18. Draw nigh to my soul, to manifest thyself to it, and that shall redeem it. 2. What is pleaser to enforce these petitions? 1. He pleads God's mercy and truth, verse 13 In the multitude of thy mercy hear me. There is mercy in God, a multitude of mercies, all kinds of mercy, inexhaustible mercy, mercy enough for all, enough for each, and hence we must take our encouragement in praying. The truth also of his salvation, the truth of all those promises of salvation which he has made to those that trust in him, is a further encouragement. He repeats his argument taken from the mercy of God, Hear me, for thy loving kindness of good. It is so in itself, it is rich and plentiful and abundant. It is so in the account of all the saints, it is very precious to them, it is their life, their joy, their all. Oh, let me have the be benefit of it. Turn to me, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, verse 16. See how highly he speaks of the goodness of God, in him there are mercies, tender mercies, and a multitude of them. If we think well of God, and continue to do so under the greatest hardships, we need not fear, but God will do well for us, for he takes pleasure in those that hope in his mercy, Psalm 147 verse 11. 2. He pleads his own distress and affliction, Hide not thy face from me, for I am in trouble, verse 17, and therefore need thy favor, therefore it will come seasonably, and therefore I shall know how to value it. He pleads particularly the reproach he was under and the indignities that were done him, verse 19 Thou hast known my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. See what a stress is laid upon this, for, in the sufferings of Christ for us, perhaps nothing contributed more to the satisfaction he made for sin, which had been so injurious to God in his honor, 
than the reproach and shame and dishonor he underwent, which God took notice of, and accepted as more than an equivalent for the everlasting shame and contempt which our sins had deserved, and therefore we must by repentance take shame to ourselves and bear the reproach of our youth. And if at any time we be called out to suffer reproach and shame and dishonor for his sake, this may be our comfort, that he knows it, and, as he is beforehand with us, so he will not be behindhand with us. The psalmist speaks speaks the language of an ingenuous nature when he says, verse 20 Reproach has broken my heart, I am full of heaviness, for it bears hard upon one that knows the worth of a good name to be put under a bad character, but when we consider what an honor it is to be dishonored for God, and what a favor to be counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, as they deemed it, Acts 5 verse 41, we shall see there is no reason at all why it should sit so heavily, or be any heartbreaking to us. 3. He pleads the insolence and cruelty of his enemies, verse 18 Deliver me because of my enemies, because they were such as he had before described them, verse 4. My adversaries are all before thee, verse 19. Thou knowest what sort of men they are, what danger I am in from them, what enemies they are to thee, and how much thou art reflected upon in what they do and design against me. One instance of their barbarity is given, verse 21 They gave me gall for my meat, the word signifies a bitter herb, and is often joined with wormwood, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. This was literally fulfilled in Christ, and did so directly point to him that he would not say it is finished till this was fulfilled, and, in order that his enemies might have occasion to fulfill it, he said, I thirst, John 19 verses 28 and 29. Some think that the hyssop which they put to his mouth with the vinegar was the bitter herb which they gave him with the vinegar for his meat. See how particularly the sufferings of Christ were foretold, which proves the scripture to be the word of God, and how exactly the predictions were fulfilled in Jesus Christ, which proves him to be the true Messiah. This is he that should come, and we are to look for no other. For, he pleads the unkindness of his friends and his disappointment in them. Verse 20 I looked for some to take pity. Pity but there was none, they all failed him like the brooks in summer. This was fulfilled in Christ, for in his sufferings all his disciples forsook him and fled. We cannot expect too little from men, miserable comforters are they all. Nor can we expect too much from God, for he is the Father of mercy, and the God of all comfort and consolation. Psalm 69 verses 22-29 These imprecations are not David's prayers against his enemies, but prophecies of the destruction of Christ's persecutors, especially the Jewish nation, which our Lord himself foretold with tears, and which was accomplished about forty years after the death of Christ. The first two verses of this paragraph are expressly applied to the judgments of God upon the unbelieving Jews by the Apostle, Romans 11 verses 9 and 10, and therefore the whole must look that way. The rejection of the Jews for rejecting Christ, as it was a signal instance of God's justice, and an earnest of the vengeance which God will at last take on all that are obstinate in their infidelity, so it was, and continues to be, a convincing proof of the truth of the Christian religion. One great objection against it, at first, was, that it set aside the ceremonial law, but its doing so was effectually justified, and that objection removed, when God so remarkably set it aside by the utter destruction of the temple, and the sinking of those, with the mosaic economy, that obstinately adhered adhered to it in opposition to the gospel of Christ. Let us observe here. 1. What the judgments are which should come upon the crucifiers of Christ, not upon all of them, for there were those who had a hand in his death, and yet repented and found mercy, Acts 2 verse 23, 3 14, 15, but upon those of them, and their successors who justified it by an obstinate infidelity and rejection of his gospel, and by an inveterate enmity to his disciples and followers. See 1 Thessalonians 2 verses 15 and 16. It is here foretold. 1. That their sacrifices and offerings should be a mischief and prejudice to them, verse 22 Let their table become a snare. This may be understood of the altar of the Lord, which is called his table, and theirs because in feasting upon the sacrifices they were partakers of the altar. This should have been for their welfare or peace, for they were peace offerings, but it became a snare and a trap to them for by their affection and adherence to the altar they were held fast in their infidelity and hardened in their prejudices against Christ, that altar which those had no right to eat of who continued to serve the tabernacle, Hebrews 13 verse 10. Or it may be understood of their common creature comforts, even their necessary food, they had given Christ gall and vinegar, 
and therefore justly shall their meat and drink be made gall and vinegar to them. When the supports of life and delights of sense, through the corruption of our nature, become an occasion of sin to us, and are made the food and fuel of our sensuality, then our table is a snare, which is a good reason why we should never feed ourselves without fear, Jude 12. 2. That they should never have the comfort either of that knowledge or of that peace which believers are blessed with in the gospel of Christ, verse 23, that they should be given up. 1. To a judicial blindness, let their eyes be darkened, that they see not the glory of God in the face of Christ. Their sin was that they would not see, but shut their eyes against the light, loving darkness rather, their punishment was that they should not see, but be given up to their own heart's lusts, which were hardening, and the God of this world should be permitted to blind their minds, 2 Corinthians 4 colon 4. This was foretold concerning them, Isaiah 6 verse 10, and Christ ratified it, Matthew 13 verses 14 and 15, John 12 verse 40. 2. To a judicial terror. There is a gracious terror, which opens the way to comfort, such as that of Paul, Acts 9 verse 6, he trembled, and was astonished. But this is a terror that shall never end in peace, but shall make their loins continually to shake, through horror of conscience, as Belshazzar, when the joints of his loins were loosed. Let them be driven to despair, and filled with constant confusion. This was fulfilled in the desperate counsels of the Jews when the Romans came upon them. 3. That they should fall and lie under God's anger and fiery indignation, verse 24 Pour out thy indignation upon them. Note, those who reject God's great salvation proffered to them may justly fear that his indignation will be poured out upon them, for those that submit not to the Son of his love will certainly be made the generation of his wrath. It is the doom passed on those who believe not in Christ that the wrath of God abideth on them, John 3 verse 36, it takes hold of them, and will never let them go. Salvation itself will not save those that are not willing to be ruled by it. Behold the goodness and severity of God. For that their place and nation should be utterly taken away, the very thing they were afraid of, and to prevent which, as they pretended, they persecuted Christ, John 11 verse 48 Let their habitation be desolate, verse 25, which was fulfilled when their country was laid waste by the Romans, and Zion, for their sakes, was plowed as a field, Micah 3 verse 12. The temple was the house which they were in a particular manner proud of, but this was left unto them desolate, Matthew 23 verse 38. Yet that is not all, it ought to be some satisfaction to us, if we be cut off from the enjoy enjoyment of our possessions, that others will have the benefit of them when we are dislodged, but it is here added, let none dwell in their tents, which was remarkably fulfilled in Judah and Jerusalem, for after the destruction of the Jews it was long ere the country was inhabited to any purpose. But this is applied particularly to Judas, by St. Peter, Acts 1 verse 20. For, he being fellow de sea suicide, we may suppose his estate was confiscated, so that his habitation was desolate, and no man of his own kindred dwelt therein. 5. That their way to ruin should be downhill, and nothing should stop them, nor interpose to prevent it. Verse 27 Lord, leave them to themselves, to add iniquity to iniquity. Those that are bad, if they be given up to their own heart's lusts, will certainly be worse, they will add sin to sin, nay, they will add rebellion to their sin, Job 34 verse 37. It is said of the Jews that they filled up their sin always, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 16. Add the punishment of iniquity to their iniquity, so some read it, for the same word signifies both sin and punishment, so close is their connection. If men will sin, God will reckon for it. But those that have multiplied to sin may yet find mercy, for God multiplies to pardon, through the righteousness of the Mediator, and therefore, that they might be precluded from all hopes of mercy, he adds, let them not come into thy righteousness, to receive the benefit of the righteousness of God, which is by faith in a mediator, Philippians 3 verse 9. Not that God shuts out any from that righteousness, for the gospel excludes none that do not by their unbelief exclude themselves, but let them be left to take their own course, and they will never come into this government, for being ignorant of the demands of God's righteousness, and going about to establish the merit of their own, they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Of God Romans 10 verse 3. And those that are so proud and self-willed that they will not come into God's righteousness shall have their doom accordingly, they themselves have decided it, they shall not come into his righteousness.
let not those expect any benefit by it that are not willing and glad to be beholden to it. 6. That they should be cut off from all hopes of happiness, verse 28 Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, let them not be suffered to live any longer, since, the longer they live, the more mischief they do. Multitudes of the unbelieving Jews fell by sword and famine, and none of those who had embraced the Christian faith perished among them, the nation, as a nation, was blotted out, and became not a people. Many understand it of their rejection from God's covenant and all the privileges of it, that is the book of the living, let the commonwealth of Israel itself, Israel according to the flesh, now become alienated from that covenant of promise which hitherto it has had the monopoly of. Let it appear that they were never written in the Lamb's book of life, but reprobate silver let men call them, because the Lord has rejected them. Let them not be written with the righteous, that is, let them not have a place in the congregation of the saints when they shall all be gathered in the general assembly of those whose names are written in heaven, Psalm 1 verse 5. 2. What the sin is for which these dreadful judgments should be brought upon them, verse 26 They persecute him whom thou hast smitten, and talk to the grief of thy wounded. 1. Christ was he whom God had smitten, for it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and he was esteemed stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, and therefore men hid their faces from him. Isaiah 53 verses 3 and 4, 10. 10. They persecuted him with a rage reaching up to heaven, they cried, Crucify him, crucify him. Compare that of St. Peter with this, Acts 2 verse 23. Though he was delivered by the counsel and foreknowledge of God, it was with wicked hands that they crucified and slew him. They talked to the grief of the Lord Jesus when he was upon the cross, saying, He trusted in God, let him deliver him, than which nothing could be said more grieving. 2. The suffering saints were God's wounded, wounded in his cause and for his sake, and them they persecuted, and talked to their grief. For these things wrath came upon them to the uttermost, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 16, and see Matthew 23 verse 34, etc. This may be understood more generally, and it teaches us that nothing is more provoking to God than to insult over those whom he has smitten, and to add affliction to the afflicted, upon which it justly follows here, add iniquity to iniquity. See Zechariah 1 verse 15. Those that are of a wounded spirit, under trouble and fear about their spiritual state, ought to be very tenderly dealt with, and care must be taken not to talk to their grief and not to make the heart of the righteous sad. 3. What the psalmist thinks of himself in the midst of all, verse 29, But I am poor and sorrowful, that is the worst of my case, under outward afflictions, yet written among the righteous, and not under God's indignation as they are. It is better to be poor and sorrowful, with the blessing of God, than rich and jovial, and under his curse. For those who come into God's righteousness shall soon see an end of their poverty and sorrow, and his salvation shall set them up on high, which is the thing that David here prays for, Isaiah 61 verse 10. This may be applied to Christ. He was, in his humiliation, poor and sorrowful, a man of sorrows, and that had not where to lay his head. Head. But God highly exalted him, the salvation wrought for him, the salvation wrought by him, set him up on high, far above all principalities and powers. Psalm 69 verses 30 to 36. The psalmist here, both as a type of Christ and as an example to Christians, concludes a psalm with holy joy and praise which he began with complaints and remonstrances of his griefs. 1. He resolves to praise God himself, not doubting, but that therein he should be accepted of him. Verses 30 and 31 I will praise the name of God, not only with my heart, but with my song, and magnify him with thanksgiving, for he is pleased to reckon himself magnified by the thankful praises of his people. It is intimated that all Christians ought to glorify God with their praises, in psalms, and hymns, and spiritual songs. And this shall please the Lord, through Christ the mediator of our praises as well as of our prayers, better than the most valuable of the legal sacrifices, verse 31, an ox or bullock. This is a plain intimation that in the days of the Messiah an end should be put, not only to the sacrifices of atonement, but to those of praise and acknowledgement which were instituted by the ceremonial law, and, instead of them, spiritual sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving are accepted the calves of our lips, not the calves of the stall, Hebrews 13 verse 15. It is a great comfort to us that humble and thankful praises are more pleasing to God than the most costly pompous sacrifices are or ever were. 2. He encourages other good people to rejoice in God and continue seeking Him, 
verses 32 and 33 The humble shall see this and be glad. They shall observe to their comfort. 1. The experiences of the saints. They shall see how ready God is to hear the poor when they cry to Him, and to give them that which they call upon Him for, how far He is from despising His prisoners. Though men despise them, He favors them with His gracious visits, and will find a time to enlarge them. The humble shall see this and be glad, not only because when one member is honored all the members rejoice with it, but because it is an encouragement to them in their straits and difficulties to trust in God. It shall revive the hearts of those who seek God to see more seals and subscriptions to this truth, that Jacob's God never said to Jacob's seed, Seek you me in vain. 2. The exaltation of the Savior, for of him the psalmist had been speaking, and of himself as a type of him. When his sorrows are over, and he enters into the joy that was set before him, when he is heard and discharged from his imprisonment in the grave, the humble shall look upon it and be glad, and those that seek God through Christ shall live and be comforted, concluding that, if they suffer with him, they shall also reign with him. 3. He calls upon all the creatures to praise God, the heaven and earth and sea, and the inhabitants of each, verse 34. Heaven and earth, and the hosts of both, were made by him, and therefore let heaven and earth praise him. Angels in heaven and saints on earth, may each of them in their respective habitations furnish themselves with matter enough for constant praise. Let the fishes of the sea, though mute to a proverb, praise the Lord, for the sea is his, and he made it. The praises of the world must be offered for God's favors to his church. Church, verses 35 and 36. For God will save Zion, the holy mountain, where his service was kept up. He will save all that are sanctified and set apart to him, all that employ themselves in his worship, and all those over whom Christ reigns, for he was king upon the holy hill of Zion. He has mercy in store for the cities of Judah, of which tribe Christ was. God will do great things for the gospel church, in which let all that wish well to it rejoice. 4. 1. It shall be peopled and inhabited. There shall be added to it such as shall be saved. The cities of Judah shall be built, particular churches shall be formed and incorporated according to the gospel model, that there may be a remnant to dwell there and to have it in possession, to enjoy the privileges conferred upon it and to pay the tributes and services required from it. Those that love his name, that have a kindness for religion in general, shall embrace the Christian religion and take their place in the Christian church, they shall dwell therein, as citizens and of the household of God. 2. It shall be perpetuated and inherited. Christianity was not to be res unius etatus a transitory thin. No, the seed of his servants shall inherit it. God will secure and raise up for himself a seed to serve him, and they shall inherit the privileges of their fathers, for the promise is to you and your children, as it was of old. I will be a God to thee, and thy seed after thee. The land of promise shall never be lost for want of heirs, for God can out of stones raise up children unto Abraham, and will do so rather than the entail shall be cut off. David shall never want a man to stand before him. The Redeemer shall see his seed, and prolong his days in them, till the mystery of God shall be finished and the mystical body completed. And since the holy seed is the substance of the world, and if that were all gathered in the world would be at an end quickly, it is just that for this assurance of the preservation of it heaven and earth should praise him.